All right. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the uh, Bible study called The Many Faces of God, uh, brought to you by St. John's Lutheran Church in beautiful downtown um, with, um, Greenpoint, uh, coming to you tonight from equally beautiful Kew Gardens. Yeah. Uh, this uh, class is being recorded, and uh, if you want to recommend it to, to people, they can pick it up later on um, Zoom or eBay, not eBay, but uh, YouTube. Facebook. YouTube. And um, YouTube. you can tell I'm, I'm not a big social media fella. You know, I can't even get the names of them right. So, but uh, you know, for the, the last month, we've been looking at you know, how God is presented to us in the uh, books of the Old Testament. And uh, tonight we get to, to take a look at another representation of God. But before we get into that, you know, I'd just like to do a little recap so you know, we know where we've been and that will give us a sense of how we're going to get to where we're going. Uh, the, the, the first representation of God that we came across in Genesis is that of creator. You know? uh, that seems to be an innate characteristic of, of God. Uh, and when God created humans it, with the intent that we would you know, uh, bear the likeness and image of God itself, that trait got passed down to us. And we are uh, uh, quite creative people in many ways. Um, you know, we've been to an art museum and just looked at you know, all the ways that people have expressed you know, their points of view, their emotions, what they see is going on in the world. You know, um, creativity has, has not been uh, trampled into the ground by historical events. <clears throat> Uh, another thing that we uh, you know, touched upon, not too deeply uh, yet, but uh, it's something that's in the background. You know? And that has to do with uh, what God is up to. I don't mean that in terms of, of a, a plan, but uh, in terms of you know, what he's hoping for, or expecting you know, from this creation that he put together. <clears throat> Yeah, it, it seems like God is uh, is primarily interested in having some sort of relationship with creation, particularly with humans. Uh, tragically, uh, humans do not uh, share that single-minded focus that we find in God. Uh, um, God does not have a life outside of you know what He has put together, uh, whereas humans have multiple interests. Yeah? I mean, that we like sports, you know, we get in, you know, engaged in politics, you know, we uh, like to make money, um, and um, a lot of other things that um, well, could be considered a distraction from the you know, primary relationship, which God hopes for, and that is a uh, relationship with the divine being himself. Yeah. And uh, that mix match or mismatch of, uh, of hopes. Um, you know, it tends to be more dramatic in the early parts of Genesis, um, that um, humans had a, a way of sort of tripping through the minefields, discovering where, where things go boom, um, such as when um, uh, you know, Cain killed his brother Abel. Now, he didn't know he was you know, taking over a prerogative that had been established by God. Uh, he used that as his defense. You know, I wasn't told I couldn't do that. You know? I didn't buy that because you know God said, "Well, you know you're getting into my area. I don't want that to happen." You know? And throughout the, uh, uh, the the future, after that time, you know, uh, God and humans are are bumping together, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what's what's expected, what you know to to hope for, what uh, uh, you know people can be held accountable for. And, <clears throat> There were times when uh, you know, God has uh, gotten so fed up with us that, uh, like in the days of Noah, he said, it's enough to this. You know? um, there's, uh, there's only one decent you know, family in this world. And um, you know, rather than destroy everything, I'm going to um, you know, let everything go um, except for the, this family of Noah. And we saw very clearly there um, that uh, God is both creator and destroyer. He holds those cards in his hand. But as time went on, and as we began to, to learn more and more about each other, um, those uh, collisions uh, became fewer and fewer. 
And last week, you know, we were um, you know, looking at uh, God's relationship with a, uh, a group of people we call the patriarchs, the, sort of the, the father figures of our, of our faith. Um, God established a um, relationship with Abraham and promised to keep those commitments until the end of time. Uh, Abraham you know, and his successors bought into that. And, uh, God had made three commitments, you know, and we will see uh, tonight and in the weeks to follow how that promise that God made to um, Abraham was played out. One of those commitments was that uh, uh, someday uh, God's people would have a place of their own, uh, some, some place where they could build their homes, plant their vineyards, grow their crops, you know, raise their children, um, and not have to, to worry about you know, it being taken away from them. The uh, other thing that God promised to do was to you know, take care of you know, this uh, group of people who called his own. Uh, he was going to protect them, give them security, make sure that they had provisions, that you know, the, the rain fell when it um, uh, was supposed to, and that the herds would increase as they were supposed to. And that's uh, akin to the third commitment that God made, and that was he said, someday, Abraham, your descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars in the, in the sky or as the sand on the beach, you know, be beyond counting. And tonight we will look at how that commitment you know, had unintended consequences as far as future generations were, were concerned. <clears throat> last week, we, I mentioned in passing that you know, the last of the four patriarchs, Joseph, you know, uh, was shipped off to, uh, to Egypt, um, where by his wit and cunning, you know, he managed to, to make a very good life for himself, um, you know, ensconced himself in the favor of the uh, Egyptian court, um, and was granted extraordinary privileges. And you know, he and his descendants decided, hey, this is a good place. But generations passed, and uh, there is a new regime that came into power that uh, did not remember or chose not to recall you know, the, the favor that had been shown to Joseph and his descendants. Um, and the, the reason why that favor was withheld is that you know, the commitment that you know, God's people would become a mighty nation was being realized in the valley of the Nile. You know? uh, Pharaoh is... Um, very concerned that the uh, Israelites will become so numerous that they will present a strategic threat to his regime, uh, also threaten to undo the, um, the, the culture uh, of Egypt um, and you know, get control of the mechanisms of government um, and in the Pharaonic reign. You know? So this Pharaoh Ramses um, put some very harsh conditions on the um, Israelites. You know, he uh, conscripted them into to labor. Um, for some reason, they were you know, deemed suitable for making bricks, um, and uh, so that was their their job. And they were really overworked uh, and uh, severely punished you know, if they failed to live up to their quotas. Uh, quotas. They prayed to to God you know, for relief, for rescue, uh, and God. Um, stepped up to the thing, not exactly knowing what he was going to do. Uh, we, we really don't see that there was any rescue plan that he was able to pull off the shelf or take out of the file cabinet. Huh? Um, so he was piecing together. And to give you a flavor of how that, uh, that was like, I'm going to ask for a reader, you know, someone who will volunteer to read a, a short passage from the third chapter of Exodus. What were the verses? Uh, 1 through 12. 3, 1 through 12. I'll read it. Thank you. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame of fire out of a bush. 
Moses looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. <laughs> then he said, come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? That's 13. Okay. Yeah. Uh, would you go back and read the fourth verse in that chapter again? Fourth verse, yep. Yeah. Um, give me a second. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Okay. In the Hebrew, those two words of importance are Yahweh and Elohim. In one sentence, we see the fusion of two of the faces of God. Um, we first encountered you know, Yahweh and Elohim as distinct personalities in the creation stories. And as I've suggested on a number of occasions, that one of the things which is happening as this time goes on is that the, um, the opposite or polar uh, dualism of the images of God you know, become uh, not just muted, um, but become integrated. And if you remember, uh, the Hegelian synthesis and um, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis in the paradigm, uh, something like that that was happening in the story. And in this one verse, uh, we uh, we find that you know the the two earliest representations of God have now been used together, um, as though it you know confirmed the, the fusion um, of the two. The other thing that this. Uh, this verse, this passage, you know, brings to a, our mind is that we have a, a new, a new face of God, which is now on the scene, and I call that face God the Liberator. You know, he has heard you know, the you know, the pleas of his people, uh, remembered, you know, he had promised to take care of them, and um, you know, now steps into you know, to that. Um, political, military, economic, uh, and human tragedy, um, and is going to do something about it. Right? So he, uh, he calls Moses you know, into a meeting. Yeah, Moses had, you know, had a, a pretty good start in life. You know, he was raised in the royal court. Yeah, it's pretty clear that he had you know, a dual identity problem. Um, you know, he didn't know whether he was going to be an Egyptian or an Israelite. Um, and, you know, in the uh, crux of the moment, uh, he saw one of his brethren, you know, being physically abused. He stepped in and uh, killed the Egyptian abuser. Now, uh, 
Moses was, was no dumb turkey. Um, we uh, realized that his uh, royal standing of privilege was not going to protect him. Now, he, he, he had wet his fingers, stuck it in the political winds, and figured out which direction they were coming from. You know? So uh, he uh, found it very advisable to uh, quit Egypt and go to, to Midian. Which, one of the uh, things, one of the things about that particular point that I've always yeah. been saying, you know, says looking left and looking right and seeing no one, he then attacked the Egyptian and killed the Egyptian. Um, but there was this rabbi at one of our synod assemblies who who said, you know, Moses looking left and looking right saw nobody else to help, and because there was nobody else there to help, he then stepped in and helped. Um, so it wasn't murder it was really um you know defense of one who was in need mm -hmm. um, and yes he still was going to face the political consequences of that um but it's um it's almost like he was looking around to see if he could get away with it yeah. and, um, but i think a better uh, you know i think a more fruitful reading of it is especially given what he does with the the women who have their their herd uh, in the next chapter, um, that he really was looking around to see, you know, is there another adult here? Am I the only adult who's going to see? It? Am I the adultiest adult who has to step <laughs> in and, and do something? Yeah. And that is a maybe a better reading of that. I, I think that you know carries a, a lot of weight. Um, you know, you know, you can look at it as you know um, evidence of fear or guilt that he. To make sure that he didn't have any witnesses to what he was about to do, uh, but yeah, you know, the uh, um, friend of the family uh, image that we talked about last week, um, you know, is uh, <clears throat> is a is a trait which uh, we humans also bear you know, that uh, we um, have a altruistic trait you know, that's into us. Uh, that allows us to to step in on behalf of others when it's not to our advantage, right? and definitely it was not to Moses's advantage, you know, to attack the Egyptian and kill him. <clears throat> right? So wait, he wait, goes wait. I, have, I have to interrupt you one more time. Okay. Because there's in the first chapter the midwives. Yeah. They, I I think they are the most, and I know we're talking about the many faces of God. I know I'm taking you off track. Yeah. But Shippa, uh, uh, Shifra and Pua, the midwives, I mean, they're the most badass people, really, in, in scripture in a lot of way. Because they're just like mm -hmm. these really lowly human beings. And they utterly defy Pharaoh, the most powerful human being on the planet. You know, it'd be like somebody in Russia saying to, to Putin, Ah, the women, they're stronger than the Russian women. They push their babies out and we don't have a chance to kill them. I mean, they were just brilliant. And, um, you know, ah, they, yeah. I just love them. And yeah, I think it's, it's a wonderful story of the effectiveness of passive resistance. You know, you just, well, or passive aggressive resistance. They're totally <laughs> subversive. I mean, they were yeah, so totally subversive. subversive. Well, it's not a character defect when, you know, we find it here. You know, it, it is a strategy you know, that uh, allows you know, the um, uh, the midwives to thwart you know, the, uh, the the decree of, of the pharaoh. Yeah. So yeah. yeah the the Jewish midwives I know they all love like these two are their heroes. Yeah. <laughs> they they should be. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, I just had to go back to that. Go ahead, Pastor. Okay. So uh, that's you always add good things to the conversation, Pastor. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, they're appreciated for, by me, and I hope by others, too. Um, I'm going to go and say one more thing about this uh, particular passage. You know, uh, what we're discovering here is little tidbits of, of what Moses is like. You know? Now, I, I remember you know, when I was a youngster going through Sunday school, you know, and this story was told to us. You know, it was pointed out that you know, Moses, you know, reluctance was, you know, a sign of his humility. Uh, I, you know, come to see that in a different light now. <laughs> it's a negotiating strategy, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
you know, it's a tough assignment that he is called to. I mean, you know, he, he is still a wanted person. Uh, and you know, if he goes into to Egypt uh, and has to deal with Pharaoh, not only is his past going to catch up with him, um, but the message that he bears is not something that is going to be well received in the courts of the Pharaoh. You know? So um, he uh, tries to wiggle out of it to some extent, but when he figures he can't do that, you know, he wants to have uh, the, the best leadership team uh, appointed that he can get. You know? And uh, so Aaron is uh, perhaps a little more glib you know, than Moses thought of himself. And uh, you know he, uh, he he came along uh, with the Pharaoh, and then later on Miriam would join the leadership team. As you know, I would say that you know, she is the um, choir leader and cheerleader for the for the, the group. Um, but that's getting ahead of ourselves. There's a, another passage that I would like us to to read out loud, uh, which illustrates you know, something about how God is going to to fulfill His promise. Okay. So uh, it's Exodus 4, verses 10 through 17. Do we have a reader? Megan? Where'd you disappear to, Megan? I I'm saw not you even here and was trying to give me clothes. Um, <laughs> I told Could her that I was busy. Um, so you said one, uh, 10 through 17? Yeah, in chapter 4, verses 10 through 17. Okay. But Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor even now, that you have spoken to your servant. But I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who gives speech to mortals? Who makes them mute or deaf, seeing or blind? It is not I, the Lord. Now go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to speak. But he said, O oh my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, what of your brother Aaron the Levite? Levite, yeah. Levite, okay. Um, I know that he can speak fluently. Even now he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, his heart will be glad. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be your mouth, and with his mouth I am, will teach you what you shall do. He indeed shall speak for you to the people. He shall serve as a mouth for you, and you shall serve as God for him. Take in your hand the staff with which you shall perform the signs. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I, I think one of the takeaways from, from this uh, section is that... Uh, if we allow our sense of self-esteem to dictate what we believe we're capable of, uh, um, we're going to get the same sort of you know slap on the back of the head that Moses got. You know? And uh, we we are uh, somewhat accustomed, I think, you know, to the earlier characters in in Genesis, um, um, sort of trifling with God's feelings at times, not not you know uh, reluctant to be sarcastic, you know. Um, you know, I, I still think, you know, uh, Sarah's, you know, uh, guffaw was, you know, the equivalent of snot coming out her nose when she was told that she was going to have a baby in, in a year. Um, you know. So sarcasm had been largely the, uh, the tool of, of humans. Now you know, it's turned against us. You know? And God says to, to Moses, yeah, well, you may think you're some sort of incompetent idiot, you know, but I have, you know, you know greater faith than you do in what you're capable of doing, um, because, you know, uh, I know that I'm going to be with you. And uh, when you get that, you know, stuck between your ears, then you will go down to Egypt, you know, take Aaron with you if you have to, um, and then you will go and talk to these, this new administration, which is um, uh, oppressing our people. And uh, so... Uh, Moses eventually goes down to, um, to Egypt, um, and before we get into you know, to that, you know, there's something else that I uh, wanted to point out. Um, <clears throat> Adam and Eve, as you know, the first um, talked about humans, um, discovered that um, uh, 
their curiosity, when it got the best of them, um, ran afoul of God. And uh, they, were, they were ashamed. You know, they were uh, embarrassed by what had happened. Um, and, and God was, you know, was quite ticked off at them, um, but he didn't end the, the relationship. He um, just said that you know, there's going to be some new conditions posed on you. Um, even though that you know, is a, an uncomfortable you know, conversation between the first humans and God, you know, it is a conversation which is predicated on the continuing existence of that relationship. It's not something which is going to be terminated, but it's going to go on. It's got new conditions and uh, new obligations, but it's going to go on. In the, uh, the, the case of the patriarchs, you know, that relationship was, was a very close one. Um, I would not say that uh, God chose Abraham and you know, Isaac and Joseph and Jacob you know, to be his buddies that you know, we they could go out to a ball game together and you know, have a couple of beers and eat very expensive hot dogs. Um, uh, but it was a uh, relationship based on, on mutual respect and confidence. Um, and it was a relationship in which the, the human characters you know, could negotiate you know, with God you know, quite fiercely in the case of Jacob. Uh, and they could be quite, you know, quite honest with God. Uh, and expressing their concerns and fears, um, the things which troubled them, as well as the things which you know, brought joy to their heart. Uh, <clears throat> now, when God decided to be the, the liberator, you know, he, uh, he, he uh, beckoned to Moses, you know, to come approach, I have something to tell you. you know? And then he told you know, Moses, stop right there. The space that you are about to enter is holy ground. You know? You know, yeah. If you do not recognize it as sacred, you know, there will be dire consequences. This, in fact, you know, creates a, uh, a distance between God and Moses. You know? And later on, we will see that you know, the, the, the separation um, or the uh, dealing at arm's length with, between the two of them. You know, would be repaired. You know, they would have a, a, um, a closer relationship. When it all starts out, you know, Moses you know, was uh, uh, apprehensive uh, about this uh, voice coming out of the burning bush, you know, confused about what it meant for him personally, uh, but also recognizing that this was a new category. This was a, a reality that he had not been exposed to on a personal level. You know? uh, and so when God said, you know, you are, you know, you're now dealing with the holy, uh, that would be part and parcel of God's future dealings with, with the Israelites. Uh, the easy familiarity and intimacy that existed you know, uh, previously you know, would not be, not be in evidence nearly so much. Uh, in this third and fourth chapter, um, God is, is described in a variety of roles, you know, different faces, if you will. Um, and uh, I'm going to tick them off you know, um, one by one. In, in uh, Exodus 3, 6, you know, um, God says to, Abraham, uh, to Moses, you know, I'm the God of the patriarchs, you know, hence the God of all Israelites, you know, including you. you know, I have not abandoned you. you know? Um, and if you remember the stories that you heard about, you know, my dealings with uh, Abraham and with uh, Isaac and with Jacob and Joseph, you, know, you will know that um, I am that same person, that same being. Uh, in chapter three, verses nine and ten, you know, we we see that God is responsive to to human human petitions and pleas. Uh, <clears throat> In uh, verse uh, 12, uh, we find out that God likes to be worshiped. Excuse me. And as I mentioned, you know, God declares that he is holy. Um, 
and that uh, he is approachable only to a, a certain extent. Um, in 320 through 22, God declares that he's a commander in chief now, that uh, Moses and Aaron is a leadership team which will handle things on the ground. Um, you know, they're to be the ambassador in the Egyptian court. Um, and uh, they're going to uh, you know, speak on behalf of God to get the freedom of, or to liberate the Israelites. Now, Moses wanted some demonstration that um, this was actually going to be you know, a, um, well, not exactly a walk in the, the park, but something where he didn't have to completely rely on his own strength and cunning. And so God you know, demonstrated to him that he was quite capable of doing extraordinary things. You know? um, Moses you know, became leprous, and then he became clean. You know? God created a snake, you know, and then the snake became you know, powerless. You know? And there's one more very strange you know, uh, thing that happens you know, before Moses sets off for, for Egypt. And um, I would like someone to read you know, Exodus 4, 24 through 26. Can you do that, Tess? Sure. Um, on the way, at a place where they spent the night, the Lord met him and tried to kill him. But Zipporah took a flint and cut off her, her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Truly, you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. It was then, she said, a bridegroom of blood by circumcision. Okay. Uh, well, a lot of that is, uh, is sort of difficult and confusing. But the part which I think is, you know, what the heck is going on? You know, you've appointed your ambassador. You know, you've given him the authority to speak for you. Um, you are... Um, you know, in a relationship with him. And then you try and kill him before he even gets a chance to, you know, to set off on his journey. You know? What's going on here? You know? And it wasn't, if it wasn't for his wife, you know, who intervened and, and what in effect was, you know, prevented God from killing his, you know, newly appointed ambassador. Um, you know, who knows? But you know? uh, what are your thoughts about this one? Okay. I have never understood this. <laughs> I haven't either. It has never made sense help. to me. It's like God had a moment and I, I don't know. There's some, I mean, it, rarely do I get to a piece of scripture and go, this makes no sense to me. This is one of those places. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Like, I mean, I'm kind of with pastor on that, but then it's like, didn't they talk about circumcision somewhere else in here? Like it's like a custom, like a, like almost like a sacrifice in some way. Um, it's a sign of the covenant. Yeah. Yeah. So, so like, we maybe, think of it as the sacrament. Maybe God was just trying to make sure like he was up for the task or something like that, or maybe he was like, oh, maybe like he's not the right guy. Like maybe I got to make sure he's the right guy. I mean, I I got to that part and I was just like, what is this? Yeah. So, but yeah, that's just my guess. Well, if uh, yeah, if God was having second wait, wait, thoughts, wait, wait, I want to I want to hear Tessa's thoughts on this. Okay, I'm very I was very confused here too, like you know it it I did have that thought, Megan, but then like the same thought because there is this sort of there's the Moses and the and the Aaron part, right? And I wondered mm -hmm. if it was gonna get to like later in the later in the book. Because af right after that, he says, the Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. I was like, is there going to be a duel here where they duke it out and see who's going to, you know? Yeah. Um, but no. And so, you know, I'm still a little bit stuck on that. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. and, the means, and the means that she uses to save him, like cut off his foreskin, rub it on your feet. It's like. Yeah, there's no precedent for that. None. None. I mean, we're, we're, there's no president for much of anything, but 
But you know, it's circumcision just, was you know, uh, an ordinance that uh, Abraham yes. had agreed to. That was a, yes. uh, yeah. a sign of the covenant. It, there never like no burning bushes and you know yeah. all this. Yeah. Stuff. It's like okay, we're just we're making more stuff up as we go. There's some stuff, but it's like you know, foreskin on the feet. I don't, <laughs> I don't get it. Yeah, there's definitely an element of like this is a test. <laughs> You know, like that was like the vibe I was getting. Um, yeah. I was like, what is going on? Yeah, it, but the, it's a question, Tess, of a test of whom? Yeah. Uh, 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 you know, it's quite possible that uh, Moses was sleeping when this was about to happen to him. Uh, and, uh, you know, his, his wife, you know, uh, boarded the, uh, the intent to kill him. Uh, but you know, we, we don't see anything in here that is, you know, would suggest that Moses you know, tried to defend himself. You know. mm. um, um, I, I'm sort of you know, speculating that he might have uh, you know, been asleep when this happened. You know. If that's the case, it's not a particularly honorable way to get rid of an opponent, you know, uh, if that's what you think you're, you're getting rid of. Anyway. Um, the wife, you know, comes to Moses' aid and saves his life. And uh, uh, Moses goes down to, to Egypt. And, uh, you know, there's a, a series of, of 10 plagues of increasing severity um, that um, uh, inflicts the Egyptians. Now, I think it's, it's important to point out, you know, um, like in, in modern warfare, you know, it's very difficult to do targeted killing, you know? Um, you know, the civilian and the military tend to get mixed up, you know, and when you go after the military, there's going to be what's called collateral damage, you know, um, which is, you know, such a sanitized, you know, description of something that is, is so horrible, you know, because, um, you know, we, we uh, esteem the, the value and, and distinction of civilians as opposed to soldiers, you know, by, having agreements of, between nations you know, that uh, uh, the military shall refrain you know, from um, uh, direct attacks on civilian targets and civilian populations. Um, if, if that was an ethical issue uh, in the time of Moses, you know, it is not presented to us in, in this um, uh, story of the, uh, the plagues that were inflicted on Egypt. Not only did they affect the uh, political and military resources of the kingdom, you know, uh, it also attacked the welfare and well-being and even the lives you know, of ordinary, ordinary Egyptians you know, who had absolutely no say uh, over what uh, the pharaoh decided, had absolutely um, no voice uh, in the decisions of government. You know, they were just expected to be you know, good soldiers, good Egyptians, and do as they're told. You know? Um, and uh, yeah, they, uh, like the average Israelite, you know, uh, could claim they were doing nothing more than you know, following orders you know, when it came to abusing and um, killing off the Israelites. Um, another thing which I think is um, interesting to, to point out in the, um, um, the story of the plagues is that you know, they are increasingly uh, harmful. Um, and you know, if, if the, the plagues were intended to change the policy of Egyptian government, it seemed very strange indeed you know, that uh, God hardened the heart of Pharaoh uh, and those policies were not changed. Um, that, that seems to me like you know, another one of these contradictions. Yeah? Um, or maybe it is just you know, um, uh, presenting you know, uh, a reason for why you know, the, um, the, the plagues were not effective in the first place. You know? um, this, this policy, we know that uh, uh, there are a lot of times when reprisals um, you know, just create more hostility against the invader uh, and increases the level of violence. And it gets to the point where you know, the, um, uh, th there's no one who can be neutral anymore. Not at all neutral. Yeah. Um, but there's, there's another thing for us to think about. You know, um, in, in addition to the you know, this seeming contradiction, you know, 
got one of these you know plagues to convince the um, pharaoh to change policy and they didn't um can you know if god can change minds like that harden hearts if you will um does that uh, diminish um, or reduce the uh, moral autonomy of human beings? What do you think? I don't know. I feel like, you know, even like back like earlier in like, like the, the creation stories, it seems like, you know, God had like a, a, a plan, but like not, you know, not a plan for like how humans were gonna like go about things. You know, like, so he can hope that, like, maybe Pharaoh or whoever is going to make, like, the, the quote-unquote, like, right or moral decision, but, like, it doesn't seem like he always has, like, the ability to totally, like, change someone's mind, even if it, like, or somebody has to be open to, like, that sort of thing, which obviously it seems like Pharaoh was just, like, I'm not going to back down, no mm -hmm. matter who's, like, no matter, like, you know, all this crazy stuff is going on, but I'm not going to back down. You know, like, so I don't know if it, I don't know if it really changes the moral autonomy because like you, you see how many like other things happen because people just make a different choice that mm -hmm. often has nothing to do with God, I think. So, you know, he tries to point us in the right direction though, it seems like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, totally. And I would, I would also add like, you know, as like the plagues were, coming like you know in the first few plagues like you notice that like you know like right off the bat there was like god hardening pharaoh's heart but like and with the way i read it, it was like you know the latter half or like the last few plagues you know there was the sense from aaron where he uh, not aaron sorry um from pharaoh where you know god sort of let go of that hardening of the heart and pharaoh was like oh my god just go already so there you know, so it's, it, it, it's, it's like God didn't have that, that same hold he did with the first few plagues. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there was a little bit of letting go of that, but still in the end, God, you know, going back and being like, you know, we're, we're I'm still going to make this hard on you. Like, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> there will be a price to be paid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Pastor, what do you think? This is another one of those places that kind of it doesn't immediately make sense to me. Like, why would why would God say, I want this to happen, but I'm going to make you make it not happen, even mm -hmm. though I said I want it to happen. Um, and if you if you anthropomorphize this, right? You, um, it kind of tracks with human experience where we say, okay, we'll do it your way. And then we take our will back. Like, oh, okay, mm -hmm. we'll do it. We'll take, and, you know, in increasing pressure, um, finally causes us sometimes to either break or yield. And, um, you know, part of this going back to the the other personalities of god the other faces of god god is a jealous god god's going to be the this guy around um is also setting up pharaoh just for the most stunning military defeat imaginable mm -hmm. um so i i almost think this is kind of like just a foreshadowing of some ways um but, you know, I, I think that one of the things that we that we don't often think about when thinking about Yahweh or and, and that we don't delve into scripture like this kind of systematically reading it along. God is messy. Mm -hmm. God is really, really messy. The people who wrote about this stuff were messy, um, trying to be faithful or trying to write in a way that made them look good um writing for a variety of motives mixed motives um but you know i i think scripture recognizes that our world is messy our interior life is messy sometimes God is messy um you know i i'm deism is very um attractive because you know that says that god just set it in motion 
spun yeah. the globe and is sitting back with a cocktail going, I wonder what's going to happen. Um, <laughs> but that, you know, that that's a very attractive philosophy um, because there's, there is an answer for everything. Well, this happened because of this physics, you know, A plus B equals C. Um, and scripture, I think, really delves more into the messiness, the unknowability um, of life. And the reality is sometimes nothing makes sense. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I, it, it, I see all not, that. Yeah, it is not helped at all by the fact that you've got four different schools who are trying to get their point of view across. You know? Yeah, and so there, there's splicing in interjections there. Uh, you know, cutoffs and little fragments that are left dan dangling. You know, um, I, I'm sure that the the story about you know God's attempt on Moses' life, you know, originally it had a much larger context. You know, uh, but you know, if this were if this were a movie, you know, that part of the story got left on the cutting room floor. You know? Yeah. So what we have is this uh, very murky, very difficult, and confusing passage. And, we see it here too, you know, you know, um, you know, it is not much of a logical leap, you know, to, to think that, well, if, if God hardens hearts, you know, like he did to, to Moses, could it not be that, you know, we are also hardened hearts, you know, have hardened hearts because that's the way God wants us, you know? And, you know, the, uh, the early Calvinists, you know, sort of jumped on that one and where they had, uh, you know, limited salvation. You know, it was not a universal. You know, there was a, uh, some who were predestined for salvation and those who were not. You know, and um, you know, sorry. You know, if, if you are not among the the elect, you know, it's just going to be miserable, horrible, terrible. You know, no good, rotten day for you. you know? um, getting time where we need to to wrap it up for the night. Um, the um, the, the image of God that we have come across this evening is, is God the liberator. I mean, we can also think of God in, in that role as God the warrior um, or commander in chief, if you will. Uh, and this was a role that would come up from time to time in the, in the history of Israel, um, particularly when God saw fit to intervene in international affairs <clears throat> and you know, come to the aid of you know, his people. So the, uh, the the concept of you know, commander in chief or warrior, you know, um, you know, does not entirely disappear. You know? It's submerged in the fusion, um, and when it's necessary for it to come forward, it uh, it will. The um, the last plague, you know, the Passover, um, was the, the the signal you know, for the Israelites to. Uh, hurriedly pack up their their gear um, and head on out of Egypt. Uh, they successfully completed the passage of the Red Sea. The Egyptian army did not, you know? and uh, uh, there was a lot of you know, you know fist bumping and uh, you know, uh, um, uh, end zone you know gymnastics and, and choreography. You know. Um, now, Miriam composed a beautiful and exalted uh, victory hymn. <clears throat> um, but the, uh, the euphoria and glory of, of their liberation <clears throat> was so short lived. Uh, <clears throat> and in the real sense that, you know, when it came to liberating his people, um, God improvised, getting them from the land of oppression to the promised land. You know, was going to be a joke as far as logistics was concerned. Um, and it wasn't long, just a matter of days, you know, before um, the Israelites you know, realized that um, weren't you supposed to take care of the bread? Uh, who was the water carrier? You know? um, wait a minute, where are the vegetables? Um, what you want me to slaughter part of my flock to feed you? Um, quickly, they turn sulky and, and whiny, you know, complaining that um, this was a, a rotten deal, and that probably in certain ways they'd been better off if they had 
not gone to the trouble to leave Egypt. Hmm. Uh, next week, we will uh, look at that you know, and look at that in the context of the, the, uh, the giving of a, a new covenant and the Mosaic law or the uh, Sinai covenant, if you will. You know, it is the you know, single most you know, you know, consequential uh, covenant, I think. I would make that argument because uh, it is certainly um, you know, enlightened, uh, enlivened, bedazzled, and perplexed you know, humans you know, ever since. You know? Uh, what does it mean to be under the um, rubric of, of this new covenant? Uh, and there is a, a, a host of attempts to, uh, to, to work that, that out and you know, to come to answers to the questions of you know, what do I have to do you know, for God to be good to me? You know? uh, and uh, as many people who asked that question, there was probably just as many, many um, answers to it. But that's a story for another night. Uh, anybody like to have uh, a last word, comment, or question? Um, I think, you know, just like talking about this tonight, it is, you know, he, God really truly did create us in his image. You know, I think like growing up, like, you know, we're always taught like God is like omnipresent, omnipotent, and like, you know, all these yeah. great things, but um, you know, like pastor said, he is messy like us. And, you know, it's, it's, it's comforting to know that like, you know, like this is really, truly like reading all of this is really, truly comforting in a way to, to, to remind us like, yeah, he, you know, he did create us in his image. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 You know, uh, like therapists, you know, like to say to their clients, you know, knowledge is powerful. If you know why you do certain things or have certain thoughts, then you're in a position to control them. You know? you do something about them. You don't have to be driven by your, your, your history or your genes. They are not your destiny. You know? And recognizing that you know, God can be um, puzzling um, and inconsistent and confusing, you know? um, for me, is you know, saying, well, you know, um, I'm like that too. I was created in the divine image. You know, and knowing that, you know, I don't have to be ruled by it. That's a paradox. So, I, I had one more thought. Uh, okay. Right. Um, and all of us have been um, in love and in relationships. Um, but there are some times when you could end a fight, but you don't want to. You mm -hmm. just keep fighting. Mm -hmm. And because um, it's, you're, you know, you're just fight waiting to happen. Um, and I, I wonder sometimes, I've wondered about this part of scripture with God going, oh yeah, I'm going to harden your heart because I'm not ready to end this. I want to fight some more. And just, you know, <laughs> like it, I mean, I, I can really see that. I mean, that's, yeah. that really is um, an anthropomorphizing God in a lot of ways. Um, but uh, anthropologists have pointed out that depending on how the nation of Israel was, their kind of political, physical, cultural reality um, genuinely reflected the mood of God. So if they were safe, God was all right. If they were under attack, God was like, kill everyone. Let's yeah. have genocide in my name. Um, and so, you know, anthropologists, when, when they go back and read this, they it's, you know, it's not a theological view, but it really is taking the, the tools of anthropology and interposing it on the stories of scripture and making sense of it that way. Um, yeah. But I, I kind of like God as just like, oh, I'm ready for a fight today, you know? You, you know, um, as uh, military knows full well, first time a soldier kills another soldier, it's horrible. Much easier the second and third time. Now. You get the taste of blood in your mouth and yeah, yeah, you go berserk. All right, well, um, if, uh, if this has been interesting and stimulating to you, I encourage you to uh, uh, let your friends know. Uh, we are, are having it you know, on um, YouTube and uh, people can pick it up from there. 
Um, if you have any questions or comments that you'd like to pass on to me, um, uh, probably the easiest way to do that is uh, through Pastor Katrina. Um, yep. And um, um, so, yeah, you, know, you can find out more about St. John's, our, 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 our mission and our services. Uh, on, um, not only we have Zoom services, uh, we have um, um, YouTube and, and Facebook. So we can be reached that way. Uh, I'd like to close our time together tonight with a, uh, a prayer. So if you will join me in turning our focus and attention onto the one person we probably should regard as the most important of them all. Gracious God, you have revealed yourself in so many different ways, so many different ways. You know? um, holy and approachable. Um, angry and kind, uh, fierce and gentle. Um, may your spirit you know, come upon us, O oh Lord, and give us the insight and the wisdom that you know, we can take these disparated polarities you know, and find harmony to the extent that there is harmony you know, in them. And where you choose to remain obscure or confusing or difficult to understand. Give us the patience, Lord, to, you know, to make our peace with that. Um, that uh, we count on you know, your presence in our life through your spirit uh, in um, helping us discern what we ought to do, what we ought to think, what we ought to uh, hold as high values. Um, so we, you know, uh, place our trust you know, in, in your care for us, you know, even though it's hard to do sometimes. You know. Lord, we thank you for this day, this night, you know, for our worship this morning, uh, for the opportunities to serve in Jesus' name and, and in his manner, doing it according to the authority that he gave us. We offer our prayers and praise and thanksgiving through him to you, our holy and one God. Amen. See you all next Sunday.